This evening, I am honored to introduce our commencement speaker. Larry P. Arne became the 12th president of Hillsdale College in 2000. He received his BA from Arkansas State University and his MA and PhD in government at the Claremont Graduate School. He studied as well at the London School of Economics and at Worcester College, Oxford University, where he served as director of research for the late Sir Martin Gilbert, the official biographer of Winston Churchill. From 1985 to 2000, Dr. Arne was president of the Claremont Institute for the study of statesmanship and political philosophy. In 1996, he was founding chairman of the California Civil Rights Initiative, a voter-approved ballot proposal that barred race-based quotas in state admissions, employment, and contracting. He is a member of the Board of Trustees at the Heritage Foundation and of the Boards of Directors of the Henry Salvatore Center of Claremont McKenna College, the Center for Individual Rights, and the Claremont Institute. He is author of Liberty and Learning, The Evolution of American Education, The Founder's Key, the divine and natural connection between the Declaration and the Constitution and what we risk by losing it, and Churchill's trial, Winston Churchill and the Salvation of Free Government, this last work is forthcoming. Under his leadership, the Barney Charter School Initiative was formed and is thriving. Founders Classical Academy was the first school to open as part of this initiative. Please join me in welcoming the president of Hillsdale College, Dr. Larry Arne. Thank you, Jason, and congratulations. Uh, some years ago, our younger daughter, Alice, gave a commencement address at a uh, graduation in Hillsdale, Michigan, where I was the commencement speaker. And I began by saying this is not the first time I've given something other than the best speech at commencement, but uh, this is the first time I've given the second best speech by a member of my family. Tonight, I'm going to be third best. Well done, girls. Uh, congratulations, uh, Jason and Charlie Cook and Scott. Um, it's an awesome thing, this. I uh, am transported by it. It's one of the strongest things I've ever seen. Um, I'd like to recognize uh, the parents of uh, the students in this school, seniors and others. Would you stand up if you're a parent of a student in the school? Congratulations to you. Um, uh, I asked the students, I spent some time with them this afternoon. They are awesome, also naughty. Um, I asked them what the worst thing was about the school, and uh, I never did get an answer from any of you. Uh, they were moving their lips, a couple of them, but they couldn't make up their mind whether to say what was on their mind. <clears throat> I asked them what the best thing about the school was, and they said in a heartbeat, and several at the same time, they said, those people, the faculty, and uh, you should be grateful to them. It's a very hard job they do, and they have prepared themselves for it for years, or they wouldn't be any good at it. Thank you for that. <clears throat> Uh, I'm going to say three things, um, how this came to be. I had something to do with the making of this mess. I'm going to say why classical education, what that is, and then I'm going to say a word to these wonderful and ambitious seniors. It won't take long. Uh, how it came to be. Um, I run a college. It's a very good college. It's the best, I think. And um, it's a very stubborn college. It's well known. We don't take any money from the government. And we teach in a certain way, and, and it's like this way, the way they've been learning. Not many colleges do that anymore, and they used to all do it. And people who get around it, they get inspired by it. Uh, our college has been very consequential. Uh, at the Battle of Gettysburg, there were about 50 young Hillsdale men in the worst place on the battlefield, and it might not have gone the way it went, except for them being there. And why were they there? Frederick Douglass, we're doing a statue of him on our campus now. 
He was on the campus twice. Why did he come? Same reason people come today, the same reason you're here tonight. Something beautiful happens when you learn the best things, especially when the young learn them, it's the best thing. And so because we run that college that way, important people sometimes punch me in the chest and tell me that we've got to do something about K through 12 education, and I've always responded for years, what would we ever do about that? And the most insistent of them sits right there. Um, he, uh, he does, he, he is, you know, you've got to, you know, like that. He's a big man, you saw him, and, um, oh, by the way, this is so important that uh, I brought my trophy wife to this thing. She's right there, and she should stand up just so you see. <laughs> If I understood it, I would explain to you why she married me, but a long time ago she did. So Steve, big Steve, he would say, these kids, you know, they don't learn anything. They're deprived of their chance. Why is that? And I would say, well, the reasons are very deep. The things that have been mentioned here tonight, the most beautiful things that have been said here tonight, are systematically absent from the typical schools in America today. I'll explain that. And he'd say, well, you have to fix that. And so about the 10th time he said that to me, I said, I've thought of something. Maybe we could help some people start some charter schools and set them up right. And uh, he said, I'll give you some money if you do that. So now where are we? We're looking for partners. Because we don't take any money from the government. Uh, the, 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 this college is never going to get a nickel from the Founders Classical Academy, ever. And uh, whatever we do, we pay for. Our partnership depends upon the school doing some things that cost the school money. And the school pays for that. So you see, we're making each other miserable. <laughs> and we're both paying our own part. It's, by the way, exactly the way education used to work for about 150 years in America. The people actually managing the schools bore the burden of it. And other people who helped, they bore their burden. It's a model, just like the old one. And the response of Ed people, they called and we thought, gosh, we don't want to do this with some big old company. And then we met these people, right? And then we met Jason. And then we see all this. Now, Steve Barney's gift is he, uh, he's a blubber baby. When he gets all upset about something or something moves him, he cries like a baby. He's very good at that. And he's cried over me so many times now that I just do just whatever he tells me to do, and he tells me what to do all the time. Thank you, Steve Barney. <laughs> Mentioned Phil Kilgore, the bald guy down there who stood up before because he's the one who actually cleans up all the messes that we make, and uh, thank you, Steve. I mean, Phil. Okay, so why classical education? Do you know what that is? Did you know when you sent your kid here? It's a weird thing. And the first thing to notice about it is there's a million very powerful reasons not to do it. And those reasons are best known to the people who actually do it. Because first of all, it's hard. I mean, uh, do your kids get tired, you parents? Do they live under stress all the time? You know what happens at Hillsdale College? In uh, September and October, and then in January and February, the beginning of the terms, it's as happy as Disneyland. <laughs> and then it, it gets to be late November, and, uh, and it gets to be late April, and it looks like a zombie movie. <laughs> Everybody's got these big bags under their eyes, right? I told these kids, I, it, it's, because they're so serious and they were answering my question so amazingly well, like college students, in a good college, I, I said, did you guys write a senior, th a th senior thesis? And everybody, including Mr. Rhea, who's, by the way, a Hillsdale College graduate, up here acting like a grown-up now, <laughs> as is Gina, as is PJ, as is somebody else I saw over there, but I've forgotten who it was now. I can't believe they're all mature. And I feel old, right? And they, and they all burst into laughter. In other words, that thing was the devil of a thing to do, right? 
And I started asking them what they wrote, and it's amazing, right? That's classical education, one aspect of it. And what, why would anybody do that? You have to learn Latin. Latin is a dead language. <laughs> That's stupid. <laughs> and here's another thing. Skype, Microsoft owns Skype, and Skype sometime in the next six months is going to set it up. Maybe they already have, I don't think yet though, but it's, it's working. You can call anybody in the world, and you can have a conversation on them with them on Skype, and whatever language they speak, and whatever language you speak, it will translate for you. So why would you learn any difficult language except the one you grow up with? By the way, I think it might be possible to call somebody on the other side of the world and have a conversation with them in Latin, neither one of you knowing any Latin. Would that work? I don't know. <laughs> but that's hard to do. That takes years. Victor Hansen, a great classic scholar who teaches at our college and who's a good friend of mine, told me that it takes 2,000 hours. That's a working year, full-time job, to learn Latin or Greek. And then nobody talks them today. Why did they do that? And it's hard on the parents, because your kid's working all the time. And think of the parties that you've missed and the movies you didn't get to go to. <laughs> and you're young right now. Why would you miss that, right? It's stupid. What are you thinking? <laughs> and the faculty, see, because you know what they do in school today? A distortion of a fundamental fact about education, a distortion of that fundamental fact has become the rule in education today. And the fundamental fact is these people do the teaching, but the decisive thing is done by them. They do the learning. Because you can't learn any hard thing. It doesn't matter how wise or, or learned the person before you is to help you, unless you are struggling with the thing hard. I ask them a question that's very serious with me, and I'm an experienced fella at this kind of thing. I said, do you talk a lot in class? And they all said, all the time, right? The classes are a big argument. And they gotta be, everybody's gotta be involved. And then I said, are they boring? And then about six of them said, never. And then there was like a 30 second, three second thing. And then the feeling, well, sometimes they said, <laughs> you see, but it's hard because here's what they do in, in school today. They believe that students can only learn what they want to learn at any given moment. And so they should really guide the activity of the day all day long. And that, by the way, is a great way to teach because it's really easy. You can just let them do what they want to. And you see why that's a distortion? Because these people are decisive, but so are these people. Uh, I took our, uh, this is the best classical charter school I know, and there's only one caveat that I have to enter on that, and that is the one in Austin, Texas, that we in Responsive Ed have started is run by the most beautiful and important academic young woman in America today, Kathleen Arne O'Toole. <laughs> but her school's only a year old and they couldn't do right now what happened here today. That's just awesome. You see? And, and they are needed. When I took my Katie, now a PhD, to look at a college where I got a lot of my education in California, I said to the admissions counselor, what are you going to teach my daughter? And she said, whatever she wants to learn. And you know, nobody's prouder of a child than I am of my daughters and sons. I said, you know, she would be coming here to get an education. And the lady said, yes. And I said, and the implication is she doesn't have one. And the lady said, well, yeah. And I said, well, why would she pick then? Wouldn't you pick? How would she pick? Could, could you give her some advice right now? And the woman was, of course, flabbergasted. And I said, what is an education, by the way? And she said, well, you'll have to talk to someone else about that, see? <laughs> That's what's wrong with the schools. It's an interior, introspective, relative to each person 
not seeking something outside each person, beautiful and fine. And that brings me to my second point, which is why classical education? What is it? When we speak of education, we speak of a period in Greece and Rome, not all of the history of those two places, only part of the history of Greece and only part of the history of Rome. When we conceive great things were done, why those two cities? What's the deal about that? What did they do? Why do we call them classical? You know, classical music and the classical period in classical music dates from, a, from a, an era a millennium later than that. So what makes it classic? And here we have to think about the word classic. And these two speakers in different ways have prepared us to understand what I'm going to say. Classical is an adjective. By the way, the only thing I know about these kids, oh faculty, that they don't know as well as they should is English grammar. So they misuse their adverbs and their pronouns. So I'm very confident that you'll be fixing that <laughs> promptly. But leaving that out of account, there are a bunch of highly educated geniuses. Classical is an adjective, and the noun is class. What is a class? What is it to be a member of a class? Here we have the senior class. How'd they get in? The answer is they worked their tails off for years. They wrote their thesis, they mastered their Latin, they know their physics, they can do their calculus. They stayed up nights doing it when other kids were having fun. And so now, in a minute, they're going to get a certificate that, that says that they have the qualities of this class. And a synonym for qualities is virtue. They have the virtue to be members of the senior class. Now, do you see what that means? That means that a class is a kind of being. This is a uh, human being, this nice lady right here, and this nice man here, not so handsome, is this nice lady. This is a human being, right? And they're very different. And you know, there's different colors in here and different sizes in here. And when we look across the crowd, we think how different everybody is for everybody else, right? And it's hard to imagine just off the top of your head, what do they all have in common? But you know, if somebody happened to lead a pig in here right now, like somebody really big might walk in, there's a Hillsdale College graduate who's six foot eight and plays in the NFL, one of the best players in the NFL. Jared Valdir is his name. And if he walked in, everybody would think how large he is, right? But then they'd forget it. Whereas if somebody brought a pig or a horse in here, they'd think, wow, what's that doing in here? It's a different kind of thing, isn't it? You could say if you wanted to, uh, I want to be a member of the class pirates, murderers, thieves, liars, ignoramuses, charlatans, right? Burglars. Are there classes like that? I'll tell you something funny. There aren't, because there aren't actually things like that. And here's what I mean by it. The argument goes, these kids seem to read a lot of C.S. Lewis. The argument goes, some people think that there's these good things in the world and there are these evil things in the world. And the good things and the evil things are in a great contest, each answerable to some great equal power up above. And that can't be true. And the reason is, if they really were equal, how would you know which one you called good and which one you called bad? or evil. There had to be some standard that was reigning that would let you separate the good from the evil. In the Star Wars movies, right, there's the force and there's the dark side of the force. And the emperor is always claiming that the dark side of the force is as strong as the other side of the force. But then you've got to ask yourself the question, 
Why do they call it dark? How do they know? Come to find out the only real things are good things. That means a pirate is an unjust person, and a murderer is an unjust person. And injustice is not a quality, it is the abnegation of the quality. And so when they become members of the class of 2015, they become a real thing, something serious. Do you know where that argument was invented? That was invented in Greece by a man named Socrates. You know what he did? He insisted on this. He would always ask people what they were doing and why they were doing it. They killed him for it eventually because it's extremely annoying. <laughs> he was a nuisance. But they would, and, and you know, he would just say the same thing over and over again. Why? 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 And you know, it's, it is very annoying and it's hard to answer. And it always drives you back. You know, I, I'm an expert in torturing the young. That's what I do for a living. I make an excellent living torturing the young. And uh, they come back for more. I don't get it. But one of the things you can do is you can say, what are you going to major in? And they'll tell you. And they say, what is that? And they never know, right? Like, can you define the word politics right now? It's hard to do. You have to train yourself for years to do it. And they're young. They can't do it, right? And it's easy to say that they, that they like to do something, get them to say that, and then ask them three or four questions, why do they like it? And they will eventually say that it is good. And then the minute they say that, say, what is it for a thing to be good? You know, several of these kids know, because both of those speeches contained a definition of the good in them, which is a remarkable thing for this age. You see? But mostly people don't know, because it's hard to say what it is. And Socrates did that to people. And he would never take the answer, it's the way we do it here. It's our kind of doing it. It's what I prefer. He never, he wouldn't hear that. He would say, what is the right way for a human being, not an Athenian, not a Spartan, not a Persian, what is the right way for a human being to live Socratic philosophy is born in that question, and that is the question that the young need to learn to answer. Classical thought is looking for that most fundamental question in philosophy. What is it for a thing to be good? You know what they teach today? There was the National Commission on the Future of Higher Education, a Republican administration. And I wrote the Secretary of Education, uh, I won't say her name, um, <laughs> she's from the state, uh, I hadn't thought of that. Um, I wrote her and I said to her, you know, didn't you leave out anything? Because what you said was, we have to have national standards for every level of education, including this level, and she was proposing for colleges, because if we don't have national uniform standards, we're never going to be able to compete with China. She was interested in power, you see? And that means, how did she picture them? Factors of production. Now it's terribly important to be able to make a living, and you're gonna be miserable if your kids leave and you have to support them for the rest of your life, right? But do you think these kids are not gonna be able to get a job? with what they have learned to do, you see? And th while they're learning to do it, you know, I know Nathan back, sorry, Mr. Rhea very well back there, and, and I know how he'll be talking to them. He'll forever be telling them how many things there are higher than money, right? And there are many things that are higher than money, and yet you need the money. And so they're being equipped, you see, by, among other things, not placing money first 
and they find their dignity as human beings in that fact. Do you understand that we are raising a generation of slaves? Now my point to you, I want to tell you how my own education began. I mean the serious part of it. I always made A's when I was a kid. I told some of the football players over there that uh, I was kind of like them when I was in high school. I was well coordinated and I could play every sport. But I wasn't big and I wasn't fast. And if I had been, I'd be ignorant of sin today. Because I just would have played ball the rest of my life if I could have done it. But no, I was good at something else. I could make A's. And I go to college and I'm studying. I got a great blessing. I met a teacher, a real teacher. And uh, I won an award in the college for the best student in the department. And there was this mandatory class in political thought. And I actually tried to use my prestige as a good student to get them to waive the requirement that I take this class. You can see what a jackass I must have been back then. <laughs> and so I was very cocky, too. And we're reading Plato's Republic. And we're in book one. And there's an old man named Cephalus he meets first, and he has an argument with him, and he goes away. And then Socrates meets this man named Thrasymachus. There are several of the Platonic dialogues, Socratic Platonic dialogues, that have as their title the name of a sophist. And what sophists were, were people who would take young people and teach them to be powerful in exchange for money. I will make you prominent. I will make you eloquent. I will make you persuasive. And then you can have whatever you want. And Socrates gets to talking with Thrasymachus. And the other people in the room include Plato's younger brother, a young man named Glaucon. So do you see what it is? This sophist and Socrates are going to have a fight for the soul of Plato's brother. Did you hear how many times they use the word soul? I think they may know what it is. So Thrasymachus announces justice is the interest of the stronger. Whatever the strong person is says, that's what the just thing is. And Socrates destroys him. And the way he does it, he says, OK, I give you that. So let's say you're the strongest. I give you that. You assume that you're the strongest. Now tell me, what is your interest? What is good for you? Explain that to me now. And, he's, and, and he says, well, what's good for me is whatever I want. And he says, is it? What do you want? Tell me, because you must want things that are good for you. What do you want? And he ties him up. And the Greek word is uh, therion, wild beast. Thersimachus, it's, it's very dramatic. You've all got to go read Plato's Republic tonight. He says, he rose up like a wild beast in anger. And you see, Socrates wins the young men. Now then... And this is the part for you. Then Glaucon, the minute that's over and Thrasymachus is destroyed, Glaucon, the younger brother whose soul is at stake, you see, he gives Socrates a charge. He says, OK, Socrates, big talk, he says. You have to prove to us then. Prove to us, he says, that justice is good even if you practice it, you will be punished. And injustice is bad, even if when you practice it, you will be rewarded. Show me that justice is good for its own sake. Now, that's one of the greatest books ever written, one of the very few greatest books ever written. And the rest of the action of that book is an answer to that question. And my point to you is, you have to seek the answer to that question. You are going to be successful. Just look at you. Live well. Do great. Don't surrender. Bless you.